Welcome everybody to our 2017 year end legal accounting checklist and tips presentation. Presenting today, we have Pamela Rosa, president of PWR Resources. Pam is a management consultant with over 30 years in the legal industry. She has hands-on experience managing small to medium-sized law firms as a managing director and is one of the country's foremost experts on legal accounting. She's a certified consultant with several practice management applications, a certified Quick, QuickBooks Pro Advisor. As a strategic accounting advisor, Pam was instrumental in Cosmolex's development of the first fully integra integrated printed practice management and accounting cloud-based application. Along with Pam, we have Erica Bursler, the Director of Strategic Communications at Cosmolex. Erica has several years of experience in the legal software industry, catering to the specialized technology needs of small to mid-sized law firms. She has given numerous presentations ac across the country on legal technologies such as law practice technology, management, cloud computing, and legal billing and trust accounting compliance. With that, I will hand the presentation over to Erica. Very good, thank you so much. So just to kind of wrap up what we will be talking about today, this is very much an accounting webinar um, as the year is ending, accounting and also bookkeeping will either already have or soon have the attention of your firm. So this is really a good time to talk about um, kind of some tips and some you know, checklist items so that can help you get through this uh, you know, busy time of the year. So the couple points that we'll be covering is first understanding law firm accounting. Uh, before we get into specific uh, tips or ideas, I think it's always important to know exactly what we're talking about, what legal accounting is, and why it's a little bit different from other businesses. And then your year-end accounting checklist. So like I said, end of year comes, a lot of different things need to take place. Whether it's you, your bookkeeper, or your accountant, um, there are certain tasks that have to be completed. So we will highlight the most essential items today, but we'll also be giving you a fully detailed checklist to take home with you so that you or your accountant can review for reference. And then we're going to go into tips for the following year, 2018. And really the best way to get a really good handle on your accounting is to start on the right foot. It goes year by year, and every year you can start better than the last. Uh, so hopefully the tips that we discussed today will help you kind of look at how you're doing things currently and maybe see ways to improve upon that. And lastly is how can technology help? Um, most of what we talk about, uh, especially when dealing with accounting, is legal accounting challenges. So the tools that you use can either help or hurt your efficiency, as well as your financial accuracy. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the first point that I mentioned is covering the legal accounting components. There are three components to legal accounting that make it a little bit different just than any other business. You do have your general business accounting. This is um, really all of the office expenses, uh, the income, uh, tracking your regular year-end reporting, uh, managing your general ledger, and that's pretty standard for most businesses. You need to be able to kind of um, you know, generate a profit and loss and a balance sheet and manage your general ledger. But the two other aspects are very unique to legal accounting, one of which is matter cost and income accounting. This is all those costs that you pay out of pocket that need to be reimbursed. That's not only a billing activity, because you need to bill them, but it's also an accounting activity. How do you make sure that those expenses are posted to the right accounts and that the reimbursement of those is posted correctly as well? And also your income. How is your income being recorded? What is being paid first? In what order? To what accounts as well? That differs from other businesses. And the last piece is fee advances or retainer accounting. That's when you're talking about um, client funds that you may be managing, whether it is uh, advances to pay legal fees and expenses, or maybe escrow or settlement funds, uh, and also the disbursement of those funds, especially if they need to be dispersed to third parties. Now, these three are not isolated. They cross over quite a bit when you're doing your regular billing, trust accounting, and also your general accounting as well. And um, very often there can be 
really everything that we talk about with the checklist today will affect each one of these categories. So it's important to know how they work together and how each of these are functioning within your firm. So um, we will start going through the checklist. Like I said, we're doing the checklist on a top level um, just to keep it simple uh, and easy to understand. But we will be providing you with a fully detailed checklist at the very end. So the first point of the year end checklist is reconciling all of your bank accounts. Now, believe it or not, reconciliation is such an important component of accounting, but is often the most neglected. It is something that needs to be done on a regular basis, but often is not. There's about 30% uh, of businesses stay up to date on their bank reconciliations. Only 30%. Um, the rest haven't reconciled for maybe six months or more. And I mean, I've even talked to law firms that say it's been multiple years, which is even worse. So this is not only essential for all not of your bank accounts, but specifically your trust accounts. You want to make sure that you're staying on top of that. Now, if you have been reconciling regularly, then a lot of this stuff should, on this uh, particular step, should be completed. And that, of course, will make your life a lot easier at the end of the year. However, if you are part of that 70% of people who are a little behind on the reconciliation, then you want to go ahead and follow these points at the end of the year. So first off, you want to clear your transactions and do that carefully. Um, you do know that uh, reconciliation really is a monthly activity. You want to stay on top of it month to month, which makes it a lot more manageable. But if for whatever reason you're behind on that, still want to go ahead and do it. But when you have so many transactions, they can kind of blend together. You might have items with the same amounts or maybe with the same name or the same date. And you need to be very careful as to what matches with what. So be sure to match those up properly. Um, and of course, the whole point of reconciliation is to verify if there's any issues. Is there something in your ledger that's not matching the bank or something that happened in the bank that's not matching your ledger? Why is that? Is there something kind of um, fishy going on in terms of how the bookkeeping is happening? Or did the bank make some major mistakes? That's the whole purpose to ensure that those get captured and rectified very quickly. The next point is when you're dealing with aged transactions. So as you're clearing items, you're going to notice that there are uncleared items. Are those uncleared items six months or older? You need to look at these. I always talk about when it comes to fiduciary responsibility, until if you cut a check, whether it's to the client or third party, until that is cashed, it is 100% your responsibility to ensure those funds are handled properly. So you need to keep an eye on what's uncleared for extended period of time and be sure that those do get addressed. Goes the same for deposits. Um, are there any entry errors as to why those items are listed there? Or is there maybe some way that you forgot the item to check it off while you're reconciling or something just didn't match up and therefore you thought it was uncleared? Again, you want to address those. When you're talking and about... One of the things... Go ahead, Pam. One of the things... I'm sorry. One of the um, important points about age transactions is it's very common for people to think, I have a transaction from 2016 that still has not cleared. I'm just going to delete it or avoid it out or eliminate it. That can or cannot be the right course of action depending upon the type of account that you're talking about. You cannot do that in trust accounting. Um, you, you must have a, a pursue having that, cleared, that uncleared transaction being cleared. So if you've paid in a real estate transaction taxes to a community, to a, a township, and that check hasn't cleared, you have to follow up on that. If it's a, a check that, um, or, or a transaction in your operating account, then that's something that you can review with your accountant or your tax professional before you just void it out. But don't just assume that because it's a very old transaction, you can just delete it from your system. Absolutely. That's a great point. You should never, if you ever find a discrepancy, which we'll talk about when we get to adjustments, if you ever find a discrepancy or something that doesn't make sense at first glance, 
your first instinct should not be to delete or write off that item. You need to fully understand why that item is there before you move forward with the process. The next point is bank, fee, uh, bank fees. So ideally, any sort of bank-related fees should not come out of a trust account. It may come out of the operating account. Some banks do take it out of the trust account. However your um, relationship with your bank is set up, you want to be aware of what those fees are and which account they're coming out of. Because very often, that will show up on your bank statement, but you may forget to have that in your record. So when you have a small discrepancy, very often, that's the reason why. Uh, so always verify that first. Some additional points uh, in regards to credit cards. If you're reconciling your credit card accounts, you need to also include finance charges if there are any, interest, late fees if those happen to occur. Um, some people get cash rewards, basically credits on their statement. Uh, when they spend a certain amount of money, you want to count for that as well. And reconcile between the two. Again, it's just a matter of making sure that everything's captured. I think from a credit card perspective, um, the main benefit behind uh, reconciling and staying on top of that and is ensuring everything gets captured from an expense perspective and also gets booked to the proper matter so it gets reimbursed. All right, so that takes us to confirming the matter link. So whenever you're dealing with any sort of transaction, it could be trust transactions or maybe even hard costs that are being reimbursed, you want to confirm that those are passed through, properly linked. I mean, ideally the system you're using shouldn't allow any trust transactions that are not linked to the matter. But in case you're doing some sort of manual setup or something that allows you to do that, make sure that everything is linked back to its proper matter. And the last item is adjustments. So like I said, adjustments is a scary area. You don't want to just say, oh, my reconciliation is off. Let me just make an adjustment. That is not, that should not be your first thought when you're reconciling. When you're wondering as to when you can make adjustments and how much and what is kind of allowed, when you're dealing with your trust account, there really is no allowance there because you're dealing with your client's funds. They're, it's not yet your money. You need to find what the reasoning is for that discrepancy. Could be a bank fee, could be an entry mistake, could be something else. You need to get down to the reason and actually rectify the problem. And when it comes to business accounts, I think very much that kind of uh, depends on, you know, what you discuss with your accountant, because there is no standard for that. And I don't know, Pam, if you can give a little bit of insight uh, or further detail as to the guidelines on that. The guidelines on making adjustments? Yeah, in and in a general account as opposed to a trust account. Um, well, the, the guidelines really are, here's how I tell, talk to somebody. If there's an adjustment, if you're doing a bank reconciliation and you have a small amount of money that you're off, the question becomes, because uh, sometimes there's a transposition error. Um, usually that can be found if it's a, if it's a, a multiple that adds up to nine. Um, but you may, need to make a decision with your accounting person as to at what point do I say I'm not going to pursue it. You know, I know a number of people. I say if it's anything less than $10. I know some places say if it's anything less than $25 that you just don't bother to, to try and find the uh, reconcile the, the error. Um, and again, that's because you know you verified that you've clicked off all of your transactions, that you've cleared everything correctly, not just to make a, a, an adjustment and then leave things uncleared, but again, to pursue it um, for a few, you know, for just a few dollars, uh, you can make that adjustment. You also need to discuss with your accountant how they want you to book that adjustment. Some programs have an automated system, for example, QuickBooks, where you can make an adjustment and it makes the journal entry for you for that adjustment. And in other, solution, in other software, you have to really put it to a particular journal account. Um, so that you have to discuss with your accounting professional. Yeah, and just to stress, that is with your general business account. Uh, that's where you're 
you know, you have a little bit of leeway because it is your own personal funds, but you really should reconcile um, and do whatever you can to confirm, as Pam said, that everything is cleared properly before you start looking towards making adjustments. All right, our next item is specific to the trust account. So of course, this is uh, the second major step in the process. And the first item to focus on is checking client retainer balances. You want to look through your uh, matters, especially with trust balances, and confirm is the work complete on those cases? Is it um, an item that you already billed for and you already got paid from the retainer? Because two points, one is, Let's say it could be for active matters and also inactive. You might have done the work and build, but not transferred the money from the trust account. Believe it or not, especially with smaller firms, it might be something that you try to batch payments together or you say, I'll do it tomorrow, and it ends up staying on the trust account, which is a bigger issue because then you don't know what in the trust account is earned and not earned. So you want to be sure to um, cover your AR as much as possible with those trust balances. When was the last transaction? Is this matter actually open? Like maybe you haven't done any transactions for them in several months. Is it sitting there just because somebody forgot to archive it? Or is things put on hold for some reason? Uh, there should be a reason behind there being no trust activity during an extended period of time. If you have- uh, One other, Erica, one mm -hmm. other point that I find is very, very common. Um, especially with, with a real estate transaction, is that you will pay something out of the trust account and then you will find that you overpaid it and so you get a refund. And now you have a small amount of money, the transaction, the, the matter is closed, but you suddenly get a small transaction back. And frequently what happens is you make that deposit saying, you know, I'm gonna write that check to the client and, and clear it all out. But if it's a small amount of money and you don't really think about it, it sits there. And so that's another thing that you want to take a look at is, are, do I have um, small amounts of money because of, due to refunds of, you know, an overpayment of something that I have to refund back to the client? Yeah, absolutely. So it could be an overpayment or maybe uh, you received, you know, a $10,000 retainer up front and you have an agreement with the client that if after working with them, you refund the remaining retainer. Again, that depends completely on your retainer agreement with that client, but if there's money left and you've agreed to refund the remaining balance to the client, that too. Go ahead and, and refund that, clean up that matter, and archive it. All right, client trust activities. So, <clears throat> are there outstanding transactions that maybe you need to pay out uh, on a particular matter? Do you have things like settlement funds that have been cleared and maybe you have not dispersed them yet? Are all of your fees taken and earned? That goes to the prior point I mentioned before. You shouldn't have AR balances, money owed to you, and money in trust at this point. That should have all, and this is a great time, end of year is a great time to kind of go through that cleanup and just verify um, going through all your cases and say, oh, what have I missed? What wasn't taken care of? And let me just kind of address that right now. And also, um, if you happen to have any funds held to pay certain expenses, you might have third party liens, uh, basically liens on a settlement or expenses that were agreed to be paid at the end of the case. Are those expenses paid? Make sure that those people get paid um, before yourself. Uh, really, those come in top priority. If there's anything remaining, of course, after that, then you want to go ahead and refund those remaining funds also. Now, when we get to balance and clean, that kind of talks about everything we talked about in the prior slide. You want to make sure to reconcile all of your trust accounts. If you have multiple trust bank accounts, all of this applies to each and every account. If for whatever reason you have five trust accounts, you need to reconcile, clean, and balance out five trust accounts. So following all the points from the previous slide, you wanna be sure to do that, especially for your trust accounts. And a unique part of that, which goes into the reports as well, is a specific trust report called a three-way reconciliation report. That is for um, any, basically a three-way check between 
what your bank balance is, what your book balance is, but also all of the client ledgers. What does that add up to? And those three numbers should match. So that's a unique reconciliation point. You should have a report for that. And keep in mind that with trust accounting, it's not just about reconciling. A lot of it comes down to having those physical reports and also any of the instruments like deposit slips, cancel checks, those types of things as well. So you want to make sure you have them and that they are archived for the year. The next point is to review your profit and loss. Now, since most law firms do report on a cash basis, we'll be following those guidelines. So just keep that in mind as we talk about um, especially income recording. When you come to the end of the year, you do want to run the appropriate reports to compare your total fee income, basically what is uh, recorded on your profit and loss as the fee income, to invoices that have been paid. Because one's a billing activity and one's an accounting activity. And you want to make sure to balance the two out. Does depend on the tool that you're using. You know, some tools have collection reports, uh, sales by like a customer type of report. Like I said, in some areas it's a billing report compared to an accounting report. But this will help you to see if there's any outstanding receivables, your AR that's kind of hanging out there that doesn't need to be, and if there's any revenue that was misposted. In paying those invoices and allocating that income, if something was allocated incorrectly for some reason, that comparison will help you to identify that. Okay, so I uh, talked about the income accounts. Next is the reimbursable cost accounts. So you may have the actual costs that are on your profit and loss. They're not necessarily going to equal the reimbursed income because not all of your costs might have been reimbursed. Could have been something you build at the end of December that just hasn't been reimbursed yet. That's kind of common. So don't be surprised if those two amounts don't match, but you do want to see how long those expenses have aged. If you have not been paid back for those expenses, is it a reasonable amount of time? Is it in the past month or so, or is it way longer than that? Is there a good likelihood that you're going to get paid? Is it time to write off that particular expense? And like I said, end of year is a great time to do some of that cleanup of items that you thought you would get reimbursed for and you never did, and it might be time to write those off. And the last piece is related to general expense accounts. So this is basically your office expenses, uh, entries for rent or payroll. You want to go through those expense accounts uh, just to see if there's anything misposted. You might see some client expenses that might be maybe entered accidentally into a general cost account as opposed to a client cost account. Um, and you also want to make sure that Everything that has different components, like for instance, payroll has a liability component as well as an expense component. You want to make sure that too is properly posted to its respective account. So just general overview. Many times your accountant will be taking care of this part, but it's good to understand the type of review that needs to take place. And the last piece, at least in terms of the checklist, in terms of the reporting, is the balance sheet. The four aspects of your balance sheet, uh, of course, there's no income or expenses. That's your profit and loss. Your balance sheet contains your assets, liabilities, equities, and over owner's draw. Now, to break down these few categories and give a few examples, for assets, it's more so you want to look back on the past year and see if the firm acquired any new assets. Does anything need to be added to the balance sheet that might not have been already? Also, have any of these assets uh, depreciated? Is that something that you need to post? And that's all based off of really the IRS schedule, but you need to add that as well. And client costs. There are some client costs that can be booked as assets, mainly if you're doing uh, contingency work or any long-term work where those expenses might not be reimbursed right away. That would fall under an asset account. So you want to make sure that that balances as well. In terms of liabilities, this does include your trust account as well. All of your trust funds do fall into your liability accounts. But you also have short-term and long-term debts that you might have. Uh, you want to know when these debts are opened. Are you following the proper payment schedule that you might have in your debt agreement? And is everything allocated properly? 
to the proper account and also to the proper debt as well. And the last bit is related to uh, equity and owner's draw. You just want to make sure that if there's a partner or owner draw in place for your firm, is that being allocated properly? And you just want to make sure that you don't have some, you know, generic expenses allocated there. You want to make sure that you have specific items uh, tagged into owner's draw as opposed to maybe just a general expense to the firm. And a common, uh, I have found that very commonly, especially with small solos or small law firms, is that sometimes the attorneys will uh, put a personal expense on their on the firm's credit card, not because they're doing anything untoward, because it's just easier to do, but pull it out of my draw, you know, post it to my draw, which is an appropriate accounting uh, way to handle it. So you want to make sure that that's done accurately so that there's an accurate reflection both for the firm's tax return and the owner's tax return, um, you know, the, the attorney's tax re personal tax return at the end of the year. Okay, very good. So let's talk about some other items uh, in terms of the checklist that you want to be on top of. First is accounts receivable or collection. You want to generate these reports as of the end of the year, so as as of 12-31-17 for this year. And in some systems, keep in mind that AR or accounts receivable can be more of a billing report because these balances are what is billed but not yet paid. So keep that in mind, basing on the type of tool that you use, you may need to look for a certain type of report. If you're using a generic accounting program that does not have an AR report, you might need to change to accrual reporting. Um, that's just a type of reporting as to you know when you're recording income. So do keep that in mind. Again, usually your accountant or bookkeeper handles that portion, but um, depending on the tool that you use, you may need to do certain things to get that AR report. Now, why do you need an AR report? Well, it's helpful to look at invoices that have aged quite a bit, maybe more than 60 days. Something should be done about those. You know, you may or may not have a uh, well-defined collections process. So now's a good time to see invoices that are, say, overdue by more than 60 days. Let me get a letter out to them or let me send them an email to try and reduce those balances before the year is closed out. Then you have the client retainer balances. This, again, ties into the, the trust accounting as well. Are there open invoices with retainer balances? Pay those invoices. And are those matters still active? If they're not active and you still have those retainer balances, like I said, you want to have a plan in place to issue those refunds so that you can go ahead and inactivate that matter and just kind of clean up not only your, you know, your software, if you happen to have a uh, client and management software, but those trust funds. If they can get out of your trust account, and to the proper person sooner rather than later, the better it is for you when you're accounting. And the last piece here is a form called 1099 um, miscellaneous. This is for non-employee compensation. So if you're paying vendors or outside parties for particular work or maybe variety of expenses, if it's that compensation is in excess of $600. So if it's higher than $600 for the year, then you need to go ahead and file a 1099 form. And usually the process in order to do that is you need to have a list of your vendors, know who you have paid more than that. And this can be, you know, witnesses that you've worked with, independent contractors, um, anybody like that, that again, was paid more than $600. You need to get their EIN numbers or social security numbers in case they're individuals. And then you need to prepare the 1099 miscellaneous for each person, as well as a 1096 form as well. So if you don't have a current method to kind of pull a list of those people, it may be worthwhile to uh, kind of create that. That too does kind of depend on the type of work that you do as well as to how many you know outside independent people you work with. And some wrap up of various account activities that need to take place. End of year, you need to run a trial balance report. Now, a trial balance report is pretty much a summary of your general ledger. All of those income, expense, assets, liabilities, all those accounts that we talked about. What are the balances of those? So you want to generate that report as of 1231, 
in this case, 2017. And then it would be up to your accountant to really look through that and make any adjustments if needed. A second step is... One uh, important point, Yep. Erica, on the trial balance. Sure. Um, one of the important points that I think people should recognize, uh, normally the accountant, your accountant will run your trial balance for you. But if you run a trial balance, at the bottom is the sum of all the debits and all the credits, and they should be in balance. So even if not at the end of the year, even if during the year you run a trial balance, and you see that at the bottom your debits out are higher than your credits, that means that there was an error somewhere in your accounting. Because remember, it's a, du a double entry system. So everything, uh, where there's a debit, there has to be a corresponding credit. So it is the kind of report that I recommend running even more than just at the end of the year, just to check to see that everything is in balance. And if not, either to find the error or to immediately talk to your accountant to see what may have gone amiss. Sometimes accountants move things around and into other prior years, and that can set off a current year's trial balance. So it is, it's not a report that you have to run on a regular basis, but it is a report that kind of helps you uh, make sure that what you're inputting into the system is going in correctly. That's a great point. And I think um, more and more we talk about, you know, every firm's a little bit different. You might be doing some of the accounting yourself, or you might be working with an accountant. If you're outsourcing or if somebody else beside yourself is doing the accounting, this is one of those great touch points. You know, of course you want to verify reconciliations and verify other reporting. This is a great touch point to just say, let me look at the trial balance and see, make sure everything's working properly. And if that's off, then you know something has to be addressed. Whether you are physically doing the accounting or not, it's an easy way to just kind of see and make sure everything's being recorded, at least in balance. Uh, in terms of which accounts are being used, that's a separate review, but in that, everything's balanced out. Our second point here is a entry for net income. You have on, depending on the system that you're using, so depending on the system that you're using, uh, some of them automatically making entry to move what's either called net income or income and expense summary for the balance sheet. And there's a journal entry uh, that needs to be done. Sometimes it's automatic in your system, depending on the type of tool that you're using. Sometimes it is not. So that net income needs to be moved to either retain earnings or owner's equity. You then need to close your books effective of the end of the year. So again, end of year, 1231, 17. Some people actually choose to do this quarterly as well. It's completely up to you. But basically what this does is if you're using a software, it will allow you to um, actually prevent anybody from making adjustments or new entries prior to that point. So if your accountant comes in quarterly, monthly, whenever it may be, and do a review, let's say for that quarter, and make any adjustments needed at that point, you can actually close it at that point so that no additional um, entries can be made prior. But of course, end of year, you wanna do that as well. Okay, so that wraps up our checklist. Uh, we're going to go now into some tips for the upcoming year to make sure that um, you're on the right foot. Uh, like you said, you may be looking at the checklist that we just provided and think, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to go about that. Or maybe it's a lot of work that your accountant is doing. And these tips are basically made so that less work is needed throughout the year and at the end of the year because things are being done right from the start. So the first tip we have is to use legal specific chart of accounts. Um, really this comes down to your general ledger, the type of accounts that you use. They are the foundation of the double entry bookkeeping. So those debits and credits that Pam was talking about before, every transaction you do has to go back to your general ledger or also known as a chart of accounts. Um, in terms of setting it up, Every accounting system has a general ledger. You can customize those general ledgers, but keep in mind that law firm accounting needs are unique. You have uh, all different types of accounts that are specific to law firms that you wanna make sure are incorporated in your general ledger if they're not already. And here's some examples of those. You have items uh, such as your trust fund liability accounts, um, advanced client costs, which is that asset client cost account I talked about, 
your reimbursed client costs, you need to post those costs to an expense account and also the reimbursement to an income account, fee income, non-reimbursable items. And this is just a sample. And one thing I do like to bring up at this point is if you're working with a bookkeeper or accountant, don't assume that they understand these accounts or legal accounting. You should have a conversation with them and ask, have you done accounting for other law firms? Because that actually makes a difference. If they've never worked with another law firm before, you could still work with them, of course, but you want to make sure they're educated and take the time to understand not only general accounting for law firms, but things like trust accounting and compliance, because that's the only way you're going to make sure that everything's being done properly is if you have somebody who's actually aware of what has to be done in law firms as opposed to other businesses. Once you have the accounts, how do you make sure the proper accounts are being used? You could put all these accounts in your journal ledger till you're blue in the face. You could have a 10 page uh, listing of general ledger accounts. How do you make sure they're being used properly? Some systems you can default accounts. Wherever you can set defaults, the better because you don't want to rely on, you know, our own memory or avoiding just human error. If it can be kind of plugged into that field for you, the better off that you are. But if not, there needs to be consistency in place. All of your costs need to be booked as they should be. All of your income needs to be booked as it should be. And yes, your end of year review will find missed postings, but the more you can prevent that, the better. Client costs. So these are those costs that are, um, as I mentioned before, you're paying them out of pocket and then you're seeking reimbursement for them. There are three points to keep in mind. A lot of issues happen with client costs. Usually, it's a loss of income for the firm. So when I bring it up in that way, saying this is how your firm will lose money, that's usually what gets the attention. Because costs, it's not particularly interesting, but if it's affecting the amount of income that your firm brings in, it should be of huge interest to your firm. So a couple points. One, reduce income leakage, which is what I'm talking about. If you post or pay that check or use that credit card from an accounting perspective, it's covered, but then forget to post it from a billing perspective and actually bill it to your client, you will not get reimbursed. And that is how you're just kind of spending things on, on behalf of your client and never getting money back for it. It's a very common issue, especially if you have your billing and accounting separate. If you're using, let's say, a practice management software for your billing and you're using, let's say, QuickBooks or something like that for your accounting, half of that is accounting, the transaction, and the other half is billing, which is the expense card. So how do you ensure that everything gets passed through? Keep a close eye on that. Um, integrated tools are great to help you ensure that none of that drops through. Accounting issues, how are these items posted? I mentioned that a little bit earlier with your um, chart of accounts. So you do have three different types of postings, and these are all related to um, tax filing and end of year reporting. So you have advanced client costs. These are typically for cases where you don't expect reimbursement in the short term, might be for longer cases like a flat fee or a contingency where you might not get reimbursed for years, if at all. You also have reimbursable client costs. Um, those are usually short term expenses, maybe hourly matters, you bill on a monthly basis. You kind of expect to be reimbursed within a reasonable amount of time. And then non reimbursable client costs are those that you don't want to seek reimbursement for, for whatever reason it may be. Those situations do come up and you need to be able to record them so that way you're post still posting it to that matter. You're still aware that that expense was for that matter, but you're not seeking reimbursement for it. Now, in terms of which cost account is used for which type of law firm, that is an accounting decision uh, because advanced client costs is an asset account, reimbursable client costs is an expense, account. Um, so if you post to the account that you don't want to post to, it's going to change your reporting quite a bit. So you want to talk with your accountant, ensure that that decision has already been made, but use tools that you don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel every time you put in a cost. You want that to be defaulted for you. And the last point is indirect costs. You may have overhead, um, maybe printing, 
photocopies, postage. Everybody's a little bit different how they cover that. Some people like to just tack on an administrative fee, uh, like 5% or $5 or whatever it may be to an invoice. And others like to itemize that pass through. Like I wanna charge you know, 50 cents per copy, which totals this for the month and bill that to the client. That is a indirect cost, also known as a soft cost. So you wanna make sure those are recorded uh, properly as well, because as you <clears throat> can see, it's a different type of account than a direct cost. And I don't know if people really understand the difference between the two in terms of the posting. An indirect cost means you've, you've incurred that cost as part of your general business operation. So when Erica rightly referred to uh, photocopying, you're paying the lease on the photocopier, you're paying for the paper, you're paying for the toner, just as a part as part of your general business expense. And then you're allocating based upon usage to the specific client. So that's why it's an indirect, and these indirect costs are frequently those that get forgotten in terms of billing, because you're not, when you go to write a check, to, uh, you know, for a court filing fee, it's easy to remember that it belongs to that particular matter. When you're, you know, billing, you know, making photocopies and you run and your, you know, your assistant runs and makes a bunch of photocopies, very frequently they're, they're rushing to get it out and they don't necessarily post it so that it is billed to the client. And that's the difference between the, between the two and why the indirect generally gets, gets uh, is, is the area where it gets forgotten. It's not billed to the client. Okay, the next point to bring up is allocating those revenue receipts. So I mentioned when we talked about the components of legal accounting that how you book your income is very different as well. So when you're handling your, uh, basically your payments that are coming in uh, for invoices, there's a billing component, which is just like, is this invoice paid and what's the balance? And then there's an accounting component, which is how do the, this is a deposit, how is that getting allocated on my general ledger? Entries have to be made. Um, now, a lot of generic or really all generic accounting systems, they're not built for law firms, obviously. So when a payment comes in, let's say I have a thousand dollar invoice and $800 was paid. I have all different types of things. Let's say I have all this on my invoice. I have some sales tax, I have some client costs, I have some late fees, and I have some fee income. How does the system know that 800, where it goes to first? In general accounting softwares, it will apply it proportionally. So you will earn a little bit of everything with that partial payment, including the fee income. The way it should happen is actually in this order. If I have that $800 payment, it should first go towards sales tax if you have that. Then it should go towards your advanced client costs if you have that, hard costs, then soft costs, then late fees, then fee income. You might have scenarios where you have a partial payment on an invoice and you don't actually earn any fee income. And that is okay, I mean, it's somewhat normal depending on your proportion of the payment versus how many expenses you have. Why is that important? Well, don't you want your costs fully covered before you start earning income? What if your client pays you frequent partial payments and by following this proper rule, you realize they only do enough to cover the expenses. They're not really generating income for the firm. Is that good? You know, isn't that something you would like to know about or, or address? And also, if you're distributing that income, if you're compensating your team based off of the income brought in, you don't want to compensate them based on costs that are reimbursed. You want it to be off of income that they're generating for the firm. So it's important to think of whatever tools you're using and ensuring that you're following this order listed here in terms of the priority of uh, receiving that revenue on your general ledger. And our last point here I want to bring up is when you're dealing with duplicate data entries, you want to eliminate it wherever possible. I mean, this goes for any business, any day-to-day -day activities. If you have to write any piece of information more than once, not only does that double the time you take during certain things, but the accuracy can go way, way down, especially when you talk about finances. 
you're dealing with retainers, you're dealing with invoice payments, you're dealing with allocations. If you need to enter this information more than once, it's going to overcomplicate everything. And when you have multiple systems to do multiple things, this is inevitable. You're going to be entering that information multiple times. So do whatever you can so that at the start of the year, whatever tools or setup that you have reduces duplicate data entries as much as possible because that will increase your accuracy. And the last point I like to bring up because this kind of summarizes a lot of the different challenges that tends to happen with billing and accounting is if you have your accounting and your billing separate, if you are using two separate tools, which is actually very common in the legal space, do be aware of the gap that exists. When you are posting matter costs, for instance, those client costs, as I mentioned, you need to cut that check, you need to create that expense card. That's accounting communicating to billing. When I need, when I receive an invoice payment, that is receiving that payment in from a bill perspective, so that's billing, but then it needs to communicate to accounting about what did I earn in income and how is that allocated on my general ledger. Trust accounting bridges both. You have the retainers, that is billing information, but also it's a liability to the firm and you need to reconcile and do your proper reporting in your accounting software. So if you do have a separate uh, system, I always like to say either A, be very mindful of that, do everything you absolutely can to do checks and balances to ensure that everything is accurate and reconciled together. It will be an extra amount of work and effort, but it is absolutely necessary to ensure everything matches up. There are tools, Cosmlex happens to be one of them, where accounting and billing are together. If you have that current setup or you're looking for that type of setup, that will avoid you know, all the double checking, checks and balances, reconciling different programs and whatnot. So whichever bucket you're in, ensure that you are doing your due diligence to make sure everything is matching just fine. All right, so you want to, uh, one thing I do want to bring up, um, I talked about the billing and accounting. Um, I do want to see, really provide you a little bit of a visual as to how all of this works. I will be demonstrating specifically the tips that we talked about because I do think it's helpful to get a visual as to really what we're referring to. It'll take just a couple minutes, um, but I think it might help to give you a sense of really how everything works. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the COSMLEX program. And as I mentioned, talk about the items that we address. So we talked about legal accounting, customization, and using proper legal chart of accounts. That's pretty straightforward. You want to know where in your system you have your chart of accounts. We happen to have it listed right here. And this is where you should see all of your income accounts, your expense accounts, liability, uh, equity income, and it's not about which tool you're using, it's about knowing that it's set up properly. Work with your accountants, understand the accounts that are here, understand if things should be changed. Um, also know if you want to create sub accounts, like for instance, where's my fee income here? Here. I decided to create sub accounts for my area of practice. That's a conversation to have with your accountant. Do you, are you a general practice? You kind of work in different areas. Have it set up so you can track in different areas. Are there different parties? Do you have originating attorneys, responsible attorneys? Do you want to track income based on those parties? Ensure that your system is set up to do that. For trust accounting, so some basics uh, to talk about with the trust account. I'm going to go over here to my list of cases. These are all my matters. Looks like GoToWebinar is a little bit behind. Let me get it. One second, there we go. Okay, so at the far right, I have my trust fund column. Whatever tool you're using, I mean, I highly um, speak against manual records for trust. I know a lot of law firms that still do manual records, but that is probably your worst case scenario. Now, if you have one matter or two matters, I understand it's just easier that way, but if you're using either written ledgers or Excel, those are extremely flexible tools. You could do whatever you need to in those tools, which is why it's not trust accounting friendly. So you wanna make sure you're using a tool that will manage your ledger, you could see the amount that you have for that person, and that you can't cut a check 
for instance, for $3,000 for this matter. I, I should not be able to. If I'm allowed to, and whatever method that I'm using, what are the chances it's going to happen? It's quite high. So use legal specific tools that just don't allow overdrafts whatsoever. It will give you peace of mind. Um, and just to give you an example of that, and like I said, trust accounting is, is just specific to law firms. So it's understanding how, um, or actually let me just do this to a third party, understanding how many tools don't. Uh, fit the compliance needs. So if I see this message pop up, I might say, oh, wait a minute. I totally did not look at what the balance was. I didn't even realize. I don't have this money. Let me reach out to the client and get this $1,000 before I cut this check. So again, it's about prevention. If you can prevent these things from happening, then not only is your end of your accounting much better, but your worries about compliance will completely go away. Right. And of course, you want to be able to reconcile um, when you have another note to keep in mind is if your trust accounting is bridging two separate tools, you may have retainers in your billing tool and also balances in your accounting tool. You need to make sure they 100 percent match because you don't want to be in your accounting tool, which is likely the most accurate because you're reconciling there have certain numbers, and then in your billing tool have different numbers. So you're earning retainer that may not actually be there. Here, I have $2,000. I know this number is correct because I'm reconciling in this program. I can actually set up for all of my different bank accounts. I'll actually go to a trust account here. I can set up my monthly reconciliation. I can mark off my items as cleared. I can make changes to whatever I need to make. So when these changes are made in the same area as your billing, you'll just make sure that the right information is earned at the right time. And the last point I do want to bring up is dealing with those client costs, because this too is a tricky area where billing and accounting do cross over, is <clears throat> think of how you're doing it yourself. Like if you pay for a filing fee right now, how is that entered? It might not be by you, it might be by somebody else in the office. How is that being entered as a transaction and how is that being entered as an expense card? So if I come here and um, let's say I want to do right here hard cost. All right, let's say I'm paying $150 filing fee today. And this will actually be to court. I can print my check here. So this is an accounting function. That's what you would typically do in a separate accounting program. And down here, I have the expense card. So I'm posting this directly to the matter at the same time. So when I save the screen, I'll have a transaction out of my operating account. I'll actually have an entry on my general ledger. See this account field? Reimbursable client costs, that's actually defaulted for me. I don't have any other options. And it's going to be posted to that matter as an expense card. So just be mindful of your workflow. If you have any way to ensure that these items happen together, that nothing slips through, that you're reducing that duplicate data entry, I think that'll help you quite a bit with your end of year reporting, also making sure your firm is as profitable as it can be because you're being reimbursed for the things you should be reimbursed for, but also you're remaining compliant overall. All right, so let's um, wrap up. Um, this is just an image just to give you a sense of what we are all about. Uh, we do have an all-in-one web-based system that in addition to trust accounting, you have your billing, your general business account, and also your practice management. So that just gives you a little image of what Cosmlex is about. I do want to leave you all with a download. So as I mentioned, you will have a checklist available to you. So this is our checklist for 2017. Please jot down that link or copy and paste it in your web browser, and you'll be able to get a full checklist for year-end accounting. I will leave that up for a few moments, and then we'll go ahead and take any questions. So if you have questions, please type those in the questions window, and either Pam or I will be happy to address. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I do want to thank you all for attending, and Pam, thank you so much for joining us today.